seated so that we can start with the program. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to one and all. On behalf of GSMC MUHS UNESCO Bioethics Unit, may I request Raivat and Prajakta to escort our dignitaries up on the dais. Dean Sir Dr. Avinash Supe, Sir, Dr. Eric Suba, Director of Clinical Laboratories at Kaze Permanente Medical Center in San Francisco and California. Dr. Sanjay Nagral, Specialist Hepatopancreato Biliary Surgeon and a Joint Secretary of Zonal Transplant Coordination Committee based in Mumbai. Dr. Barve, Director of Tata Memorial Hospital. Dr. Amar Jasani, Co-Founder of Forum for Medical Ethical Society, a researcher and a teacher by profession. Welcome all. I request Supe sir to welcome them with a very special envelope. Sir, please welcome the dignitaries. This envelope is very special because it has the KM logo 90 years with a stamp on it, with a postal stamp specially for the 90 years celebration of say GSMC and KM on 22nd of January this year. Thank you, sir. I take this opportunity to introduce to you the GSMC MUHS UNESCO Bioethics. This unit was formed in the month of August 2015 with a solemnization of the unit under the MCGM, that is Municipal Corporation of Greater Mumbai, Nodal Bioethics and affiliation to UNESCO Chair in Bioethics, Haifa, Australia on 9th November 2015 at Topiwala National Medical College. Mr. Sanjay Deshmukh, Honorary Additional Municipal Commissioner and Dr. Suhasini Nagra, Director, Medical Education and Major Hospitals were handed over the UNESCO Charter and the writ for establishment of the MCGM MUHS UNESCO Nodal Center for Medical and Dental Institutions by Professor Russell D'Souza, Head, Asia Pacific Bioethics Program of UNESCO Chair in Bioethics, Haifa. Dr. Arun Jamkar, the Honorary Vice Chancellor of MUHS, Dr. Shekhar Rajdirkar, Pro VC MUHS, Dr. Susan Vizay, Regional UNESCO Advisor, Bangkok, Deans of the MCGM Run Medical College, Dr. Supe, Dr. Ramesh Bharmal, Dr. Merchant, Dr. Chaturvedi, grace the program with their presence. Dr. Supe, Dean, said GS Medical College, received the writ for GSMC MUHS UNESCO Bioethical Unit. With a vision of establishing highest level of ethical and professional standard in health professions and education, practice, and research. Under his leadership and with the steering committee, headed by Dr. Santosh Salagri from medicine, Dr. Padmaja Marathe from pharmacology, and members of various other departments and disciplines like physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and nursing, the GSMC MUHS UNESCO Bioethics Units, a very healthy and active baby in its infancy, already conducted four programs on ethics since its inception in November with its inaugural, inaugural there. The workshops that were done were for the first MBBS physiotherapy students, nursing students on the first module of ethics, bioethics essay competition to choose students for the students' wings and the winners were established into the student wings of this unit, bioethics grand round. Today's event that is the 8th Krishna Raj Memorial Lecture on Contemporary Issues in Health and Social Sciences has been instituted by Anusandhan Trust. This is a collaborative venture of GSMC, MUHS and UNESCO Bioethics Unit, Sehat, Center for Inquiry into Health and Allied Themes, Masoom, Mahila Sarvajin Utkarsh Mandal, Forum for Medical Ethics Society, E-Social Sciences, 
TIS and Mumbai University. With this brief introduction, I request Supe sir to welcome the gathering and give his opening remarks. Sir, please. Dignitaries on the dais, Dr. Eric Subha, Dr. Sanjay Nagral, Dr. Badwe, Dr. Amma Jassani, all the dignitaries who have, and the guests who have come from all these sectors, all my ethics committee colleagues from KEM and Tata Hospital, members of Sehat and other associations, my students, friends. I think it's a really pleasure to welcome you all in this 90th year of celebrations of my own institution, St. G.S. Medical College and KEM Hospital, which has really been giving a huge amount of humanity work for last 90 years. KM Hospital established its Ethics Committee way back 1989 when the concept of Ethics Committee was not very well known in, this, in, the, in the country and the city. And since then, for last so many years, KM Ethics Committee as well as the Tata Ethics Committee has been one of the first to get accredited by the international kind of forum. So, wonderful kind of an ethics committee are running in our institutions and we have seen the complete change how it has really happened into the ethics of medical research. For my ethics committee meeting which is to be a 15 minute meeting over a cup of tea to the whole day spending on to that committee meeting and discussing every kind of a project into detail there has been a complete transformation which has occurred over the last 25 years and which is a very welcome change. Along with that this year, we have really introduced GSMC, MUHS, Bioethics unit with full purpose that we should start ethics education from the first MBBS and it will be completely throughout their career. And last week, we also started the chair of humanities so that all these attitudes and professionalism will be inculcated in students from their first year of their career. And with this kind of a program in mind. We have been conducting various programs and this today's talk has been with collaboration with all the associations and when Sehat asked me that we want to have a lecture, I readily agreed because I thought this is one forum where probably all these issues need to be discussed, clarified and the thought process of everybody in this research scenario gets a clear insight as well as the approach which is going to be there. So on on this moment, I would like to really thank you for coming and I welcome you on my behalf of this GSMC, MUHS, the Biotech Unit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. I request the dignitaries to please take the seat in the audience. Krishna Raj Memorial Lecture, our annual series on contemporary issues in health and social sciences to honor the intellectual and academic tradition that Krishnarad set in place. To know more about Anusandhan Trust and the KR Memorial, I take the pleasure in inviting Dr. Vibhuti Patel. Dr. Vibhuti Patel is professor and head of the University Department of Economics of SNDT Women's University, Mumbai, and director, Center for Study of Social Exclusion and Inclusion Policy. She was awarded PhD from University of Mumbai in 1988 and did her postdoctoral research at the London School of Economics and Political Science in 1992. She had made many contributions in women's studies and gender economics. She has authored many books like Women Challenges of the New Millennium. She co-authored Indian Women Change and Challenge, Reaching for Half the Sky, co-edited Macroeconomic Policies and the Millennium Development Goals, and Empowering Women Worldwide. She has edited the book, Discourse on Women and Empowerment, Girls and Childhood. After knowing that she is all for women empowerment, I invite Madam, please, to tell us something more about the Anusandhan Trust. Dignitaries and August audience, I have a pleasant duty of giving you a profile of Anusandhan Trust in its Silver Jubilee year. I would like to add one thing, that there is one more uh, co-sponsor of this lecture. From the very beginning, SNDT Women's University has been part of Krishnarad Memorial Lecture and the very first uh, lecture was organized in the SNDT premises. 
uh, Anusandha, we need to understand the historical context of formation of Anusandha Trust. It was in the late 80s where a lot of questioning of dominant discourse was happening because of the newly formed social movements, even in the health movements, uh, there were a lot of uh, new uh, insights were coming in. It was in this context that the founding trustees of Anusandha Trust, who happened to be doctors, social scientists, uh, and scientists, uh, decided to come up with an institution which would give more intellectual freedom, more freedom to the researchers to get into the pro-people uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, the construction of knowledge and with the experience in research, teaching and active involvement in various social movements, we thought that we could come up with a path-breaking uh, researches and uncarved out uh, charted areas that we could probe into and with this mission uh, Anusandhan Trust was founded in 1991 uh, to strive and it, its mission is to strive for universal access to social security which is equitable, ethical, socially just and accountable and responsive to the needs of people. Uh, Anusandhan, the priority areas of uh, Anusandhan Trust were also determined by the massive, extremely shocking experience of uh, Bombay riots and riots in India where hospitals were flooded with thousands of bodies, doctors, the whole health system was collapsing, did not know under what, what kind of, uh, uh, how to, we, to cope up and provide support services to the survivors, how to prevent violence and it was in this context that we, the, the, the realization came that we need to have an interdisciplinary perspective, we can't be in our cocoons, uh, in our own discipline of medicine or social science or anthropology or epidemiology, we need to connect it with the larger socio-political uh, developments that are taking place and the priority areas that Anusandhan Trust decided was to promote research, advocacy because research should not gather dust, they have to reach out to the larger uh, society. So advocacy, then also services, training uh, and activities which was acronymed at RASTA within a human rights framework. And it, another very important priority is to evolve evidence-based policy framework for human development and social security, and especially in the areas of public health policy, health rights, health systems, and financing, women's rights, and rights of all marginalized sections of society. And the third very important mission, the priority we have is to reach out to the governance structures, whether it's a criminal justice system or state administration, local self-government bodies, and uh, 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 political uh, uh, structures also, academic institutions, citizens association and professional bodies. Uh, the founding principles, like the two important centers that Anusandhan Trust uh, uh, founded uh, were Sehat, Center for Inquiry into Health and Allied Themes, and Sathi. And these two uh, uh, centers, they have, been con they have continued uh, with variety of activities, uh, with social relevance, democratic functioning, ethical concern, social accountability, and the most important multicultural ethos in the context of the, the the onslaught of cultural nationalism that we are facing. Gender sensitivity and responsiveness, you know that Anusandhan Trust you, ma, ma, has an equal number of women trustees uh, who have made mark in the, in the niche areas of uh, uh, research and advocacy. Now these two centers, they have developed around these principles and if you see the kind of work that Sehat has done, it is basically directed at demanding access to health and healthcare as a right and investigate human rights violation. So it has come up with the Charter of Patients' Rights. They have also come up with a uh, whole uh, study on health needs of aging population, violation against women, sex, sex selective uh, abortions happening in India, and what kind of legal structure that we need. They have also filed public interest litigation in 1994 to seal the loopholes in the PNDT Act, and by two th after six years of consistent legal battle as well as advocacy managed to have in 2002 PCP and DT Act with all the, uh, with, where the preconception diagnostic tests are also under scrutiny. Uh, Sehat has also, the niche area of Sehat is uh, examined with technical expertise uh, examining the women's issues, the, the, uh, examining the women's health needs and women's health rights, including reproductive rights. We know that during 70s and 80s, women's movement in India had focused on variety of issues. It all started with excesses uh, conducted, uh, excesses in the name of family planning <laughs> during emergency rule. So women's uh, health needs have always been a central concern in the 
women's movement, and I think that was crystallized in the form of very rigorous research done by Sehat on violence against women. First of all, uh, sexual violence. They came up with the safe kit, the protocols and guidelines uh, for examination of survivor of sexual violence, domestic violence act, the experience of the LASA played a very important role in coming up with the 2005 new law, uh, protection of women from domestic violence. And also the LASA has been replicated in six states of India and I think three hospitals in Mumbai city, which is a one-stop cri crisis center. We have members of YWC and several women's organization who are here, who are providing support to uh, the LASA and the Sati uh, is a, works with a right-based approach, promoting the perspective that instead of substituting public health system or replacing them, it is essential to make these systems accountable and effective through organized and sustained public actions. And Sati has fostered uh, grassroots level, like uh, health rights. They have they had a ma major campaign called uh, Abhi Amcha Arogya Sati, where they train the health workers from the village who are rooted in the local uh, ecosystem, and they are also working in collaboration with government of Maharashtra for monitoring of National Rural Health Mission. And they are partnering with the civil society organizations and they are facilitating local, district, state and national level advocacy on health issues combined with action-oriented research and publication. Uh, Sati has also done collaborative advocacy for ensuring social control and regulation of private healthcare system. They, they are uh, dedicated and with missionary zeal, they are promoting the cause of universal health care at a Maharashtra state level. They have done monitoring and audit of social audit of health system. They are involved in policy, uh, like evidence-based policy research uh, and related advocacy. And training and capacity building in local language, regional language is their USP. Uh, Anusandan Trust also founded Center for Study in Ethics and Rights, which functioned for nearly nine years, from 2005 to 2013. Uh, it was, it, this focus area was ethical concerns in social science research and biomedical research. CSCR also worked closely with Forum for Medical Ethics and also contributed for organization of National Bioethics Conference, which has become now a very prestigious democratic plot platform to discuss uh, ethical concerns. Uh, many research-based articles of CSER scholars are published in Indian Journal of Medical Ethics, the copies of which are outside this hall. It is also available, it is in the public domain, it's easily it can be easily downloaded from Google. Uh, from uh, CSER team organized training workshops for several research institutions and NGOs. And due to financial difficulties, because everyone talks of ethics, but when it comes to investing in ethical research, I think everyone shies away. So that's the reason CSER had to close down. Now, it is the, this is the uh, overall uh, work profile and the intellectual output uh, that uh, Anusandan Trust has nurtured. And it is in this context we need to locate uh, Mr. Krishnaraj's role uh, as a friend, as a um, uh, supporter. And uh, when Krishnaraj uh, passed away in January 2004, we started discussing that we need to institute a memorial lecture on contemporary issues in health and social sciences because he was always very, very receptive to the new uh, ideas and the new uh, understanding that came from grassroots level experience. We used to have study circle in the 90s, which he religiously, only two senior citizens attended this study circle by the young professionals, and they were Dr. A. R. Desai, sociologist, and Mr. Krishna Rajan. They always acted as a sounding board. They enriched our understanding by giving case studies of their wide experience based on their experience. So we instituted this lecture to honor the intellectual and academic traditions that uh, Krishna Raj set in place, as my previous speaker told. This is a humble tribute to the memory of visionary editor of Economic and Political Weekly, uh, and to keep alive his memory as a friend of Anusandan Trust team, who always encouraged efforts at critical thinking in health studies and medical anthropology, and uh, provided support in terms of intellectual engagement with us. He always gave his valuable time to discuss uh, issues with us. He advised us on publications, and that's why you can see that most we have such a huge uh, bulk of knowledge construction and generation of database because that health database has been used by all the uh, official and uh, civil society organizations. Uh, 
the, the uh, lectures that we have had so far, we have had eight uh, KR Memorial lectures. The current one by Dr. Eric Suba is on RCTs and ethical norms. The previous last year, we had uh, Dr. Betsy Hartman, a veteran feminist scholar who spoke on rethinking population education, challenging the gender and structural violence in prevailing norms. She went into the whole you know, psychophancy about population control and the kind of uh, uh, human miseries that inflicted on it and the whole paradigm shift from reproductive control to reproductive rights. That whole journey she narrated in her Lucid lecture, it is available on YouTube. Um, uh, then sixth uh, Krishnarad Memorial lecture we had was by Dr. Yogesh Jain of JSS uh, and he spoke on ethics of public health interventions, a view from the front line. He's a front line worker, what the kind of problems we are encountering. The fifth KR Memorial lecture was on universal access to health care where Dr. Krina, Shirina Threddy from Public Health Foundation and Dr. Armando uh, Filo from uh, Latin America, Mexico. They talked about, uh, made a very strong case with a lot of evidences and case studies in favor of universalization of healthcare from the point of view of both efficiency, because we economists are obsessed about efficiency, and, uh, uh, and equity. Uh, uh, Fourth Krishna at Memorial Lecture was on, again, equity and healthcare, where Geeta Sen very lucidly uh, deconstructed the data set we have, macro level data set, as well as uh, all the uh, researches that have taken place uh, on health equity. And she, she gave an uh, intersectoral uh, analysis and also inter, uh, of the uh, philosophy of equity and how it is being implemented at a uh, ground level. Third Krishna Rad Memorial Lecture was, uh, it was not a lecture, but it was a whole day workshop on clinical trials and healthcare regulations in India, a very important concern we have had for la in the health movement for the last two decades. Uh, second uh, Krishna Rad Memorial Lecture was on dominant development and people's alternative uh, play and interplay in Chhattisgarh by Professor Elena Sen of TISS through light on the path of development uh, and Chhattisgarh is touted as a most uh, 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 most uh, ideal model for development in the 21st century in the government circle. And she deconstructed this whole uh, facade of de uh, development and said that what was happening at a ground level, how a person like Binayak Sen, who was fighting for people's right, uh, were imprisoned, uh, was imprisoned at that time, and there were the, the, uh, the privatization and commercialization of uh, land and water, how, what kind of human miseries it was bringing, and as against that, the ray of hope in the name of Shahid Bhagat, Shahid Bhagat Singh Hospital, which was run by the Workers' Cooperative, she, she narrated in her lecture. The first lecture was by Dr. Aniruddha Krishna uh, on unmaking, making and unmaking of poverty, social science, social programs, and poverty reduction in India and elsewhere. That was held at SNDT Women's University. And uh, that uh, he uh, tried to explain how certain sections of population, they managed to go either above, from below poverty line to above poverty line, and from above poverty line to below poverty line, what were the factors uh, that were responsible, and it was based on a household level, a very big uh, uh, survey. So this is what the bird's eye view of Innocent and Trust is, and we are very happy that we have reached this stage of Silver Jubilee celebration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, madam, for giving us an insight into the working of Sehat, Sathi, the Anusandhan Trust, and the KR Memorial Lectures. Ethics is the matter in us. It is in every form. It is in every act, every deed, and every thought, be it our daily course, be it a clinical practice, or research. I take this honor and pleasure to invite for today's session Dr. Sanjay Nagral, to chair the session on the KR Memorial Lecture by Dr. Eric Suba. The specialization in hepatopancreatobiliary surgery and liver transplantation. He practices in Mumbai both in public and private sector. He is the coordinator of Department of Surgical Gastroenterology at Jaslok Hospital and the head of Department of General Surgery at KB Baba Municipal General Hospital. He was involved in the first successful liver transplant program in Western India. He is the Joint Secretary of the Zonal Transplant Coordination Committee based in Mumbai and the chairperson of its liver committee. He is the publisher 
and member of the editorial board of the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics and the chairperson for the Forum of Medical Ethics. He has over 100 publications and is peer-reviewed medical journal to his credit. He is also involved with the Jan Swasthya Abhyan, which is the Indian circle of the worldwide people health movement. We welcome you, sir, and ask you to conduct the proceedings further. Thank you. You hear me? Is the mic working? Okay, so uh, first of all, let me say that uh, I consider it a matter of uh, great honor and privilege that you have uh, asked me to chair today's duration. Uh, in fact, when I was first uh, asked to come and share this oration, I had some doubts as to whether I really qualify for this job. But I accepted, and I accepted for two reasons. The first, of course, is the fact that I missed no opportunity to come back to this institution where I spent uh, almost 20 years of my life as an undergraduate student, then a postgraduate student, and then, of course, in the faculty of the Department of Surgery. But I think the second more important reason why I chose to accept this and be here today is because of the uh, bond that I have shared with almost all the players that were present in uh, today's meeting. So starting right from uh, Krishnaraj and EPW, I didn't know Krishnaraj very well, I met him only once, but uh, in the last five years I've been writing regularly for EPW, I, I did a blog for them. To all the organizations that uh, are are involved in today's meeting. Of course, the State GS Medical College KM Hospital, uh, Stata Hospital, I, I spent a year and Dr. Padwe uh, was, was at that time uh, leading uh, a lot of path-breaking work in breast cancer. Uh, the Sehat, uh, uh, who is the main organizer, and I have been witness to the birth and growth of Sehat over many years. Um, E-Social Sciences, SNDT, and of course the Forum for Medical Ethics which was founded in this institution, uh, some of you would be interested to know, by uh, Dr. Sunil Pandya, who was the then head of neurosurgery in this institution, who founded this small little journal called Engine Journal of Medical Ethics, which has now grown to its uh, current uh, predominant position. Um, so I am now going to uh, introduce uh, to you uh, the uh, person, uh, Dr. Eric Suba, who uh, is going to deliver today's oration. And uh, I'm going to sort of, uh, most of you have a sense of his background because I think you have been given uh, some material on uh, Dr. Soba, his background and his training and his interest in the area that he's going to talk about today. So primarily he's a pathologist, uh, the director of the clinical laboratories at the Kaiser Permanente Medical Center in San Francisco, which I am uh, perhaps, uh, am I right in saying that one of the largest managed care that in the United States. Uh, Dr. Suba incidentally has had an interest in cervical cancer for many years. Firstly as a researcher uh, and then of course as a, as a very close observant and critique of the way uh, research has been conducted in this area. Uh, he led for many years the Viet American Cervical Cancer Prevention Project, an all-volunteer non-profit organization uh, which was founded in 1996. And subsequently, this organization uh, uh, implemented the uh, papinoculu or the pap cytology screening services in southern Vietnam. And just before the lecture, I asked uh, Dr. Suba as to why Vietnam. And uh, the answer he gave me was interesting. He said that he thought that he owed it to them. So a lot of uh, interesting historical perspective here, uh, where a group of researchers from the United States decides to go to Vietnam uh, and do some path-breaking and the ground-level research in a problem which the Vietnamese face and which many of the other developing uh, countries of the world continue to face, which is cervical cancer. Dr. Suba, of course, also has a commitment to rapid, effective cancer prevention, and uh, he has been, as you will uh, see in today's oration, a critique of uh, what he calls uh, U.S. taxpayer-supported studies of cervical screening uh, in countries including India. Dr. Suba recently has been appointed as a visiting scholar at the National Center for Biotics at the Tusk G University in Alabama. Uh, now, some of you would know that this town in Alabama was the center of the infamous Tusk G study, uh, which is a study done on Afro-American men with syphilis, in which 
uh, many of them were just put into what, that, what at that time was called observation. And later on, this was the subject of a huge controversy in the United States, which had ripples all over the world. And in fact, in 1997, uh, President Bill Clinton uh, actually issued a presidential apology to the victims of uh, the Sajji study. And that's something that uh, perhaps uh, we should be aware of. So today's uh, oration by Dr. Subha is provocatively titled, The Golden Rule, a Remedy for Decadence in Global Health. When I was reading to some of the writings on this subject uh, in preparation for today's, uh, my, uh, my attempt at today's introduction, what struck me was that the topic that he's going to cover today actually touches uh, perhaps one of the widest spectrums of uh, discourse, various discourses that impact on healthcare. So it's about science, it's about economics, it's about public health, it's about ethics, it's about gender, it's about class. And before I hand over the uh, mic to uh, Dr. Subha, I must say that this is exactly the kind of interdisciplinary, intersectional uh, uh, area that would have definitely excited uh, somebody like Krishna Raj. And in fact, EPW is, is perhaps the best example of a publication which has attempted over the years of his existence to involve all the disciplines in, in, a, in one of the best, uh, I would say, uh, publications of that sort in, at least in this country. So with these uh, words of introduction about uh, Dr. Subha and uh, his, uh, his topic for today, may I now welcome Dr. Subha to the Thank you for that kind introduction. And I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to express my most sincere gratitude to uh, uh, the King Edward Memorial Hospital and uh, AT and uh, CHAT, IJME, and all the other conference organizers for offering me this honor and this terrific opportunity to speak all, to all of you today. And to each and every one of you, thanks for coming this afternoon and taking the time to come and hear what we have to say and, and uh, discuss. In terms of disclosures, I have no personal relationships with any of the commercial interests relevant to this presentation. But I am an American taxpayer. And as such, I've indirectly contributed money to the studies that I'll be discussing today. And for that, I sincerely apologize. I also have to disclose that I've submitted allegations regarding the Tata Memorial Study to the US Office for Human Research Protections and to the US Office of Research Integrity. And I'll, um, have more to say about that later. First, a little background information. This is a, uh, a cartoon illustrating how cervical cancer comes about. Cervical cancer begins with infection of normal cervical tissues by human papillomavirus, HPV. In less than 1% of cases, HPV infection becomes cervical cancer over a period of many years, 10, 20, 30 years. And during the 10, 20, 30 year period between initial HPV infection and the onset of cervical cancer, the cells of the cervix undergo characteristic changes called dysplasia. And dysplasia is another term for a precancerous lesion of the cervix. Cervical screening prevents cervical cancer and lowers cervical cancer death rates by detecting and treating these precancerous lesions before they develop in a cervical cancer. So the goal of screening is to use this 10-year, 20-year, 30-year window of opportunity to detect precancerous cervical lesions and to treat them effectively. There are three established methods for detecting precancerous cervical lesions. Visual screening tests, abbreviated as VIA, were introduced into routine clinical practice in the 1930s. Pap smears were introduced into routine clinical practice in the 1940s. And HPV tests, human papillomavirus tests, were introduced into routine clinical practice during the 1990s. Each of these three methods, used correctly, is an established and effective way to prevent cervical cancer and reduce cervical cancer death rates. Here's an outline of the three studies I'll be discussing today. The first of these three studies began here in 1997 and ended in 2015. It was conducted by Tata Memorial Hospital with funding from the US National Cancer Institute. 
The second study began in Osmanabad in 1999 and in 2007. It was carried out by the World Health Organization's Institute, uh, International Agency for Research on Cancer, with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The third study was conducted in Tamil Nadu by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, which is often referred to as IARC, also with funding from the Gates Foundation. All three of these randomized trials compared cervical cancer incidence rates and death rates among large groups of women who were offered cervical screening to incidence rates and death rates of cervical cancer among women offered no screening whatsoever. And as I hope to explain, the, the use of unscreened control groups and death rate measurements was scientifically unnecessary and resulted in deliberately allowing human beings to die merely to contemplate questions that had already been answered. I think we'd all agree that this is not a good place to be. And the other part of my lecture today is I wanted to propose that we move from this place to what I call the golden rule. And that leaders of important institutions embrace the golden rule and assimilate the policy implications of that, of that ideal. The Delphi exercise is the method that I'll propose that we use to move from the status quo to a more hopeful future. This is a graph showing the effect of pap smears on two different communities, the United States and southern Vietnam. In the first half of the 20th century, cervical cancer was the number one cause of cancer-related death among American, among American women, which is the situation in many low- and middle-income countries today. The introduction, of, the introduction of pap screening to the United States led to dramatic reductions in cervical cancer incidence rates. My own experience in Vietnam began in 1994 when I traveled there and began uh, relationships and friendships with the, uh, uh, the cancer care community there. In 1997, maybe with some, some encouragement from me, the vice presidents of the Vietnamese Cancer Society, which is the organization in Vietnam that has explicit authority to um, uh, formulate cancer control policies for the country, the leaders of the Vietnamese Cancer Society committed to pap screening for the prevention and control of cervical cancer in Vietnam. And between 1998 and 2003, cervical cancer incidence rates declined by about 50 percent. There's nothing mysterious about that. The U.S. Preventive Services Task Force is the closest thing that the U.S. government has to an honest broker of information about preventive health services. And the Preventive Services Task Force has determined that the introduction of cervical screening to previously unscreened communities reduces cervical cancer rates by 60 percent to 90 percent within three years and that these reductions of mortality and morbidity are consistent and dramatic across populations. Cervical screening and no smoking are two of the very few interventions to get an A recommendation from the task force in the absence of randomized trials confirming effectiveness. To compare, mammographic screening gets a, a B recommendation from the task force and PSA screening for prostate cancer gets a D recommendation. In 1984, the Imperial Cancer Research Fund concluded that with the exception of no smoking, cervical screening offers the only major proved public health measure for significantly reducing the burden of, cervical, of, of cancer today. In 2004, I published one of my early objections to the randomized trials happening in India. I pointed out then that contemplating questions that had already been answered had practical implications. That if any of the no screening arms in any of these studies concluded that cervical screening did not reduce cervical cancer death rates, that conclusion would not be believed by anybody and would not be extended to or would not be generalized to any settings outside of the study settings. I also maintained that if the death rate measurements in the intervention arms showed that cervical screening did reduce cervical cancer death rates, that that conclusion would be considered trivial and unimportant. And so 
I argue that there was just no reason to be doing these randomized trials with unscreened control groups and death rate measurements. What's more, I was under the impression that policy making in India uh, and efforts to implement surgical screening in India were being delayed pending the completion of these randomized trials. And I pointed out that no one unaffiliated with the tobacco industry has suggested delaying lung cancer prevention efforts pending completion of randomized trials comparing smoking and no smoking. And in 2004, I published my first call asking that women enrolled in no screening arms of these randomized trials be, be reassigned to screening arms without further delay. A month after this article was published, I went to Lyon, France to uh, co-author a handbook on cervical cancer screening at IR headquarters. Um, that's me in the background, and there's Dr. Sankara Narayanan. And uh, I circulated a copy of, of this article to every person in this picture. And then during the plenary session, where, the, uh, where Dr. Sankara Narayanan, uh, where his data from India was being discussed, I asked the, the collected group that um, well, I pointed out that readers of our handbook might have questions about why an unscreened control group was used in these, these studies. And I suggested that we include an explanatory paragraph to answer those questions to the readers of our handbook. And that suggestion was dismissed without discussion. Even though before the plenary session, I had private conversations with other co-authors who shared my concerns. The co-authors who in private agreed with me would not come forth in the plenary session to help move my proposal forward. And I'm telling you this story just to, uh, just to, to uh, point out how difficult it is for a lot of experts to express their true feelings when it comes to controversial ethical issues in the field. That the uh, concern about uh, negative impacts on professional advancement are, are real and significant. My most recent call to um, offer screening to the unscreened was published in IGME in 2014. And in that publication, I also called for compensation to the, um, uh, to the women in the studies who suffered avoidable harm and death. Before I go further, I'd like to take a big step back, 20 years to 1996, and um, before any of these randomized trials started, to give a snapshot of where things were then. And this is a publication by a group that included uh, physicians from Tata Memorial Hospital and, of course, uh, Dr. Sankara Narayanan. And this is a study of, of an intervention called downstaging in India. And the conclusion of this study was that it's highly unlikely that unaided visual inspection, which means downstaging, could be a useful procedure for the control of cervical cancer. Furthermore, the logistics of visual cervical inspection are considerable and may not be that much less than implementing routine, routine regular cytology screening. Now, when you take these two observations together, you think, well, if that's the case, why not just roll up our sleeves and start doing cytology screening in India? In Vietnam, the leaders were assessing the same information and came to that conclusion and in 1997 committed to pap screening in Vietnam. And an important question is, how did we get from this mindset to a mindset where 15-year randomized controlled trials were initiated the following year? And to help understand that, I'd offer the explanation of uh, what I call a zombie invasion. Now, I don't know how many people here watch as many horror movies as I do, but zombies are recurring characters in horror movies. They're humanoid creatures, and their most distinguishing characteristic is they're impossible to kill, or nearly impossible to kill. You go after zombies with shotguns and uh, axes and um, uh, chainsaws, but they keep coming. No matter what you do, they keep on coming. Paul Krugman is a Nobel Prize winning American economist. I, I like to think that he and, and uh, Krishnaraj would have been good friends. For all I know, they, they, they were, but I don't know if they ever met each other. 
And uh, Paul Krugman has his own personal version of an economic and political weekly. He writes twice a week a column in the New York Times. And it's from one of, or it's from several of Paul Krugman's columns that I learned the idea of a, of, of a zombie argument. And a zombie argument is an argument that's proven wrong. It's been proven wrong many times. It should be dead. It should have died a long time ago. But it keeps lurching forward because it serves a political purpose. The argument that pap screening is not feasible in countries like India is one such zombie argument. Its political purpose is to serve as kind of a philosopher's stone uh, to transmute public health interests into research and commercial interests. Think of it this way. Let's assume for the sake of argument that the zombie argument is true, that pap screening is not feasible in India and countries like India. In that case, research and development of alternatives to pap screening are fundamental humanitarian necessities. And so research into, for example, HPV vaccines and HPV tests become front and center fundamental humanitarian necessities. On the other hand, if this argument is false, which it is, and if pap screening is actually, is actually feasible in India and in countries like India, then all that research into, for example, HPV vaccines, and HPV testing, starts to look a lot, a lot less like humanitarian necessity and a lot more like exploitation. For that reason, this zombie argument keeps lurching forward. The most powerful performance-enhancing drug for any zombie argument is money. And in 1999, the Gates Foundation established the Alliance for Cervical Cancer Prevention with a gift of $50 million. The Alliance includes five nonprofit organizations, including IARC and a group called PATH in Seattle. The Alliance's central founding assumption is that anything but pap screening was the most likely solution to the problem of cervical cancer in developing countries. So the power of the Gates Foundation got behind the zombie argument that pap screening is not feasible in developing countries in 1999. And the results were profound and immediate. Here are a couple of examples of, of zombie arguments that I'd like to show you. These two quotes are from the same issue of a bulletin of the World Health Organization in, I think, September of 2001. This is from an article by Mike Trenji and colleagues. These, these, this is like a, an eight-author paper. The authors were uh, physicians from countries in East, Central, and Southern Africa, from Sub-Saharan Africa. And they wrote that 95% of institutions at all healthcare levels in East, Central, and Southern Africa had the basic infrastructure to do pap screening, but only a few women were actually being screened. In other words, they were saying that pap screening was feasible, but the political will to do it was not there. In the same issue, Dr. Sankar Narayanan, who is the chief of uh, cancer screening at IARC, uh, contradicted the view of the African leaders and said that, in our view, many low-income countries, particularly most of those in sub-Saharan Africa, have neither the financial and manpower resources nor the capacity in their healthcare services to organize and sustain screening programs of any sort. Now, I like to think that people who actually are writing from the countries they live in have a better sense of what's feasible in their own backyards. But the zombie argument contradicted that. And as it turns out, it's a zombie argument that prevailed in this case. My favorite example of this zombie argument is a comparison of these two quotes. In 2005, speaking of the Osmanabad study, Dr. Sankara Narayanan wrote that our results clearly show that good quality cytology can be implemented even in the rural country, even in, the, even in, in, in a rural setting of a developing country, i.e. India, with reasonable investment. So you'd think that this would kill the zombie once and for all. But even as recently as 2014, he is writing again, the fact that population-based cytology screening is not feasible in India is not our invention. Now, if this top quote had been written nine years after the bottom quote, it would make sense. But to have this written nine years before this, as you can see, makes this a zombie argument. So let me talk about the first of the three RCTs. The, uh, 
Tata Memorial Hospital, RCT. This is a publication from 2014. Um, and note that it, it leads as it must with the zombie argument. Because pap smear screening is not feasible in India, we need to develop effective alternatives. Now, as we've seen, um, the goal of cervical screening is to detect and to treat precancerous cervical lesions before they progress to cancer. And because that's the, the mission of cervical screening, the single most important quality of any cervical screening test is its detection rate for precancerous lesions. If the, if the detection rate of a cervical screening test is zero, then the test is worthless. And you want to maximize that detection rate. Here are the numbers from the uh, Tata Memorial RCT. And uh, for years, I, I puzzled about this. Dr. Shastri at Tata Memorial conducted a study in Mumbai that was published in 2005 using VIA as a screening test. And he found in that study that the detection rate for precancerous lesions was 0.9%. And 0.9% is a very close figure to other studies that had been done in India using VIA and uh, cytology screening for the, uh, as, as a benchmark for precancerous lesion detection rate. In 2010, when um, the first publication came out from uh, reporting detection rates from the Tata Memorial Hospital RCT, I was shocked and puzzled at the detection rates that were documented in that publication. They were 30 to 50 fold lower than the detection rates documented in Mumbai a few years before. And at these numbers, 0.02%, 0 they were effectively zero. So the Tata Memorial RCT was using a screening test that failed to detect precancerous cervical lesions. And I was very confused and perplexed as to what was going on. In 2014, a college friend of mine who's an investigative journalist in the United States, Bob Ortega, used the U.S. Freedom of Information Act to get documents from the U.S. government pertaining to the uh, Tata Memorial RCT. And that made everything much more clear. In examining the documents from the past, we found out that the Tata Memorial RCT began as a downstaging study. That it actually began as unaided visual inspection and was changed to visual inspection with acetic acid sometime during the first screening round. But although the screening test was changed, the performance of the screening test remained the same. The, um, the goal of the, of the intervention used in this study was a downstaging goal, not a screening goal. Downstaging is an intervention that, by design, fails to detect precancerous lesions. Downstaging is, is an esoteric concept where it's thought that by simply detecting cases of invasive cancer at earlier, more curable stages of disease progression, you can lower cervical cancer death rates. You won't lower cervical cancer incidence rates, but you'll lower cervical cancer death rates. Now, it's important to understand that no competent physician would ever recommend or adopt a cervical screening test that, by design, does not detect precancerous lesions. Downstaging and direct visual inspection was the intervention that had been studied during the 1990s and that, by 1996, had been found to be obsolete. Now, how and why we could, get, we could get from a mindset like this to one year later funding a 15-year study to study an obsolete intervention is an important unanswered question. But what is answered is the difference between this number and these numbers. The disease, the, the disease detection rates achieved during the Tata Memorial Hospital RCT are radically lower than the 0.9% achieved during this, the uh, screening test because the intervention studied in the Tata Memorial RCT was a downstaging study. That the Tata Memorial RCT 
is published and advertised as a screening study when in fact it's a downstaging study is somewhat problematic. But the implications of this are very important to understand. This means that by design, the Tata Memorial RCT withheld valid cervical screening tests. And by a valid cervical screening test, I mean a cervical screening test that by design will detect precancerous cervical lesions. But the Tata Memorial RCT withheld valid cervical screening tests from over 151,000 women in both the intervention and control groups during the 15-year period required for enough women to die from cervical cancer to assess whether the obsolete downstaging approach, which by design could not prevent cervical cancer, might nevertheless reduce cervical cancer mortality rates. It's also unclear and probably unlikely that any of these 151,000 study subjects will ever receive valid cervical screening tests. The women in the intervention group have already received three or four rounds of downstaging, and they're not slated to get any more interventions. And the women in the unscreened control group, it's unclear whether, they're going to be whether, whether they'll eventually receive a valid cervical screening test or just one of the downstaging tests, which is not very helpful. Now, I know that what I have to say is very difficult to hear, but please keep in mind that those two previous slides are based on these numbers. And if anybody can, exp can give me another explanation as to why these numbers are the way they are, I'd love to hear it. Withholding valid cervical screening tests from 151,000 women for 15 years required informed consent procedures that were determined to be unethical by the U.S. Office for Human Research Protections. The U.S. Office for Human Research Protections is the branch of the U.S. federal government responsible for ethical oversight of medical research conducted or supported by the U.S. federal government. This office determined in 2000, 2012 that study subjects with Tata Memorial RCT had not been given adequate informi information about the life-saving life differences between cervical screening, downstaging, and no screening. But the question I'd like to put out to you is whether we really needed the U.S. Office for Human Research Protections to tell us that unethical informed consent procedures had been used. Because just think about it. Think about, hypothetically, a conversation between the principal investigator and a woman who was interested in enrolling in the study. The investigator would have to tell that woman that cervical screening is a scientifically proven life-saving intervention that would significantly reduce her risk of dying from cervical cancer in the future. That's part of informed consent. You've got, you, you've got to tell somebody that. And then the same investigator would have to tell half these women that Congratulations, you've been randomized into a no-screening control arm for the next 15 years. Now, told those two facts, what sort of, what sort of person would agree to participate in a no-screening arm for 15 years? As I've written in IGME, to suggest that Indian women would knowingly consent to be randomly assigned to more death instead of to more life is to suggest that Indian women are unimaginably stupid. So informed consent was a necessity to begin and to sustain these unscreened control groups. In 2013, the, office, the U.S. Office for Human Research Protections ended its review of the RCT without requiring Tata Memorial to notify the RCT subjects that their consent had been unethically obtained back in the 1990s. And I'm uncomfortable with this situation. I'm uncomfortable that the information known to OHRP and to Tata Memorial Hospital is not known to the study subjects themselves. And I just point out that probably at some point in the future, some or all these study subjects are going to find out that their trust has been betrayed, and that the longer we wait to tell them, the more upset they're going to be. The plot continues to thicken. In 2015, okay, the U.S. Office for Research Integrity is the branch of the U.S. federal government 
that's responsible for monitoring, the, monitoring scientific misconduct in studies funded by the U.S. federal government. In 2015, the U.S. Office for Research Integrity launched an investigation into credible, credible allegations that I had supplied that data falsification may have nullified the scientific validity of the conclusion from the Tata Memorial RCT that downstaging had reduced cervical cancer mortality rates. Now, I don't want to take the time to go through the data and the irregulators that I submitted. What I've done is I've included in this PDF file that will be available to anybody who wants it, I've included the two tables that uh, I submitted to the U.S. Office for Research Integrity and that are, that are now included in a publication undergoing peer review so that anybody who wants to review the irregularities that I submitted to the U.S. Office for Research Integrity may. This shouldn't come as a shock to anyone. Richard Horton is the editor-in-chief of The Lancet. And last year, after a weekend-long meeting with the editors-in-chief of the world's other major medical journals, uh, Dr. Horton concluded that half of the scientific literature is false and that nobody is ready to take the first step to clean up the system. We're not in a good place. But what this means is that if people like you and me don't take steps to clean up the system, we can't wait on anybody else to do it for us. So now the Osmanabad study. The Osmanabad study compared cervical cancer death rates among women offered VIA screening, HPV screening, and pap screening to cervical cancer death rates among women offered no screening at all. Here is the Osmanabad RCT in a nutshell. Pap smears were associated with no cervical cancer death rate reduction. Only HPV screening was associated with cervical cancer death rate reduction. And the, uh, the implicit assumption in these RCTs that there's nothing better than death to answer scientific questions, that death is the ultimate yardstick, that you can't argue with death because, after all, it's death. And the conclusion of the Osmanabad RCT was that the superior death rate, re death rate reduction of HPV screening was caused by superior HPV test performance. Now, when you look at just this simple table, that's what everybody would conclude. There's a fundamental problem with this study, though, and that's that superior HPV test performance did not exist. Test performance is measured by disease detection rate. In Osmanabad, pap smears actually had a higher disease detection rate than HPV tests did. Yet, pap smears apparently did not cause death rate reduction, but HPV tests did. The central f fundamental logical absurdity of the Osmanabad study is that effects resulted from causes that did not exist. I noticed that in the paper. I was mortified. How could this wind up in the New England Journal of Medicine, for crying out loud? You know, are they asleep at the switch? So I went and I, I used my 175 words to write a letter to the editor. And you, you know, with the New England Journal, you have to be polite. And I wrote that the unexpected lack of correlation between detection rates reported for the screening tests and sub subsequent mortality rates requires careful consideration. Because you, you've heard the expression, not all correlations are causations, which is true. It's equally true that all causations are correlations. So if there isn't a correlation, there cannot be a causation. That was the point of my letter. Dr. Sankara Narayanan's response was shocking. He responded that HPV testing had a higher detection rate than that of cytologic testing or VIA is clear from our findings. What this means is that another zombie argument was at play in Osmanabad. The zombie argument in this case is that the number 1.0 is smaller than the number 0.9. I don't think anyone needs special training or an advanced degree to realize that that's an impossibility, that's an absurdity. 
But if you don't believe that 1.0 is smaller than 0.9, then you cannot accept the conclusions of the Osmanabad study. This is a zombie argument. It, it should have died immediately, but it keeps lurching forward because it serves several political purposes, one of which is money. This zombie argument launched a global marketing campaign for the Kiogen Hybrid Capture 2 HPV test. This press release came out simultaneously with the end of the embargo by the New England Journal on the Osmanabad study. And note here, Kiogen will donate 1 million HPV tests with a total estimated value of 30 million US dollars. Again, using basic arithmetic, that means that the HPV tests cost 30 US dollars apiece which is radically un unaffordable for women in Osmanabad. So this zombie argument launched a global marketing campaign for an HPV test unaffordable among the communities where death rates from cervical cancer had been measured. Take a long look at this slide, because if that's not exploitation, I don't know what is. The plot thickens when you know that in 2004, PATH, which is one of the members of the Alliance for Cerebral Cancer Prevention, entered into a partnership with the manufacturer of the hybrid capture HPV test to market HPV tests across the world. Now, when I bring this up, um, members of the Alliance get very upset with me because you know, when you bring up the possibility of financial conflicts of interest, all of a sudden people can't hear you, they can't they can't hear anything else. And I understand that, I, I really do. I, I'm very sensitive to that. And so uh, when the members of the Alliance whom I'd share this information with would get upset with me, I respond, I would always, you know, and I still respond, as I did in writing in 2007, that what PATH and the Alliance should do is fully disclose the terms of their partnership with Kiogen for public review. So that way we don't have to worry about it just make it public so we can review the relationships and satisfy ourselves that there's no funny business going on. And that was in 2007. I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting for an answer. But also note another implication of this zombie argument. The zombie argument that 1.0 is a smaller number than 0 0.9 also means that the Osmanabad study is the first study in world history to conclude that high quality pap screening does not reduce cervical cancer death rates. No explanation was offered for this unprecedented conclusion. Now imagine if the New England Journal had published the results of a randomized controlled trial that showed that smoking did not cause lung cancer. I mean, you'd think that somebody would say something. That, well, isn't, isn't that a little unexpected? Isn't that a surprise? But the prestigious New England Journal of Medicine publishes a study concluding that pap screening does not prevent cervical cancer, and nobody said a word. The zombie argument that pap screening in Osmanabad did not prevent cervical cancer is exactly what the Gates Foundation wanted to hear. It's that conclusion provided a caricature of vindication for the central founding assumption of the Alliance for Cervical Cancer Prevention. So in 2009, with the publication of the Osmanabad study in the New England Journal of Medicine, the research team in Osmanabad, in Osmanabad gave the Gates Foundation exactly what they had paid for in 1999. So getting back to this, extraordinary study conclusion. How did this happen? I mean, how, how, how did a, a screening test that out, how, how did pap smears which outperformed HPV tests wind up not causing any reductions in cervical cancer death rates? That study was taken up by a team of researchers at the University of Pittsburgh, um, Marshall Austin and Chin Chen Zhao. And they published a paper in 2009. They, they, real, they, they did an independent reanalysis of the Osmanabad data set. And they found that the apparent failure of pap screening 
to reduce cervical cancer death rates was actually a manifestation of very peculiar statistical biases that were skewed in favor of the HPV test. Austin and Zhao said that they had no evidence that these, irregular, that these irregularities were due to deliberate data manipulation, but everybody should come to their own conclusions. Now, when there's credible evidence, when there's, when there's, when, when, you know, when there's credible suggestion of data falsification, there should be some oversight, some appeal that you can check on that. I mean, the Office of Research Integrity does that for studies funded by the U.S. Uh, by the U.S. federal government. A peculiar finding from the Osmanabad study is that apparently it's not subject to any oversight whatsoever. It was conducted by IARC. It was funded by the Gates Foundation. That means that the U.S. Office of Human Research Protections has no oversight of this study. Um, I submitted allegations regarding the study to OHRP. They said they had no jurisdiction to look into it. The U.S. Office of Research Integrity has no authority to look into the, uh, the data analysis of the study. So this is human research apparently without any checks or balances. And that's a quite disturbing finding. Finally, I'd like to talk about the Tamanadu study. This was conducted, it started in 2000, it was the first one to end in 2006. It compared cervical cancer death rates among women offered VIA screening to those death rates among women offered no screening whatsoever. The problem with the Tamanadu study is that it established that this set of, of screening studies produced irre irreproducible results. The Tamanadu study with this principal investigator concluded that VIA, VIA reduced both incidence and death rates of cervical cancer. The Osmanabad study concluded that VIA reduced neither incidence nor death rates from cervical cancer. That, by definition, is a set of irreproducible results. Of course, Dr. Sankara Narayanan was challenged about this. Uh, this colleague wrote in a letter saying, you know, this, this discrepancy has to be explained. And the response was that, shucks, we just don't know. We can't figure it out. And sorry, you know, when, when this kind of question, when you get stumped by this kind of simple, important question, it's time for a little humility. The actual explanation is that, it, as it turns out, the, you know, using death as a yardstick, which should never have been a component of these studies in the first place, using death as a yardstick, just at the end of the day, proved that death is a lousy yardstick. That the use of death as a yardstick just produced irreproducible and absurd results. So here are the three RCTs of which I've been critical over the years, and it's, it's difficult for me to envision uh, you know, more egregious betrayals of basic scientific and ethical principles. And um, where do we go from here? In 2011, we did what's called a positive deviance analysis. Um, in Vietnam. A root cause analysis is something you do when something bad happens, when an airplane crashes, or when a patient dies from a blood bank transfusion. You do a root cause analysis to find out what happened, what went wrong, and what to do to keep it from happening again. A positive deviance analysis is what you do when something good happens. Um, Vietnam succeeded in making a big dent in its cervical cancer problem. And so we, uh, we did a positive deviance analysis by which you find out what happened, what went right, and what can you do to keep it from happening, or to, to make it happen again. And what we found is that what went right in Vietnam was not technology. What went right in Vietnam is that the right people at the right time had their hearts in the right places. And specifically, in Vietnam, the leaders in that country were committed to the ideological goal of improving health outcomes as rapidly as possible among as many people as possible. So to keep good things happening in other places, I think it would be a good idea to get other leaders to buy into this golden rule because they, they, should, they, they, should, they, they should be doing this in the first place. So um, I would suggest that the world would become a better place 
if leaders at places like IARC, the US NCI, and the Gates Foundation would embrace this golden rule and assimilate its policy implications. Now, you don't see the golden rule listed in the mission statements of the US NCI or the Gates Foundation yet. Maybe it should be. But then to assimilate the policy implications, I suggest that a Delphi exercise would be appropriate. The Delphi exercise has a, has a strange background. It was uh, developed back in the early years of the Cold War at the RAND Corporation, which is a think tank in Santa Monica, California. And it originally was, uh, was invented as a way of getting contentious factions of the US military to talk to each other about the impact of new thermonuclear weapons on warfare. The Delphi is a tool for structuring conversation. It allows and helps facilitate conversation among diverse and sometimes contentious individuals. And its two main characteristics are structured information flow and anonymous interaction. And those two main characteristics reduce the negative consequences that can come about when face-to-face -face interactions are used for group decision making. And those include these uh, well-known psychological effects of group thinking, of group think and bandwagon effect, halo effect, so on and so forth. Here's how Adelphi works. When I've organized these, I use this website that's, uh, that's maintained by the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania. It's free, it's easy to use. I suggest all of you take a look at this, and, and um, we use it in my department at Kaiser Permanente for quality control. What happens is the Delphi exercise begins when you get a message in your email inbox, like you know, you've been invited to participate in a Delphi exercise. You open the message, you get a link. You click the link, and you're taken to your own um, confidential spot on the Delphi website. And there you see a, you see a series of questions. You click on the questions one after another. Uh, this Delphi was conducted simultaneously in Vietnam, Guatemala, and Mexico. So it was conducted in three different languages. So you go there, you click on the question, you read the question, you enter your answer. And then once you've finished answering all the questions, you can go back to the website and you get to see what everybody else has answered. So you read the responses from all the other participants in the Delphi exercise. And after you've read everybody's responses, you answer the same, you, you, you have an opportunity to comment on the responses and to modify your own if you'd wish. The important thing to know here is that you can't tell the author of any given response. So the information is anonymous. And this allows people to more easily change their minds and revise their positions and to critique the, the, the positions of others. The Delphi that we wound up using uh, for those three countries wound up with 11 questions. And um, this is a, a proposal I, I submitted as an, as an invited editorial in the Journal of Cancer Research and Therapeutics in 2014. And it goes through the 11 questions. But the main questions that are um, addressed in the Delphi are these four. And notice that, I mean, some of these questions are, are, are quite important. For example, will the introduction of HPV vaccines accelerate or decelerate reductions of cervical cancer rates in your country? That's a question that's of fundamental importance that really nobody's discussing. And the goal of this Delphi is to use the, so the Socratic method for simulating the policy implications for the golden rule. Because the Delphi fundamentally recognizes that the single biggest problem in communication is the, is, the, is the illusion that has ever taken place. And this is, this is a real problem. I think all of you can appreciate that in your daily lives and workplaces and other places. And so I'd like to conclude with a proposal. I'll be happy to organize a Delphi exercise for cervical cancer prevention in India. And I, I invite today uh, this institution, King Edward Memorial Hospital and Tata Memorial Hospital to participate in this. We can begin once I get email addresses for six or 12 participants, and we can conduct the exercise online and then come back here and talk about the results face-to-face. -face. 
thank all of you for your time and attention. It's been an honor to be here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Subal. I described your oration as likely to be provocative, and uh, I guess I was not very wrong. Um, we, the plan is to, uh, before opening it to the audience, of course, uh, to have uh, two individuals uh, uh, who will be responding or discussing uh, Dr. Subal's uh, presentation. Uh, the first individual I would like to invite is uh, Dr. Rajendra Padve, who is the director of the Tata Memorial Center, one of the leading, uh, uh, I would say, a rare surgeon who has um, done research in very um, fundamental issues, uh, well known for his work in breast cancer, especially the timing of breast cancer surgery, also an alumnus of uh, this institution. Uh, so I will hand over the mic now. Uh, to Dr. Badway to uh, respond. I must uh, express as it is uh, an ethical norm um, to, to declare the conflict of interest, and I am one of the investigators in the study that has been shown just now, so that's a major conflict of interest. And it would have, it would have been ethically sound if our dear guest had also declared his uh, conflict of interest that he has been the treasurer of Papanikulu Society of Cytopathology and presently is the chair of the Budget and Finance Committee for the Papanikulu Cytopathology Society. Um, let's come to the study that uh, we looked at and I have a few comments related to that. The study was presented um, to the NIH for an R01 grant. We got that R01 grant. Prior to that, there was a review by ICMR looking at feasibility of pap smear in India. And there is a publication from Usha Lutra in BMJ stating that it is not feasible to have pap smear being implemented across the country. The third implication is that <coughs> the OHRP, when they looked at, uh, Suba mentioned about 2012 and 2015, about the ethics of conducting the test, as well as falsification of data, and it didn't conclude as to what was the finality of that investigation. Both the investigations uh, have concluded from OHRP saying that there is neither any falsification of data because all the data was put forth. It is available at the NIH site for the response to these queries. And uh, there is no unethical conduct as far as the conduct of trial is concerned. The, finally, when we looked at the results, the results show a 31% reduction in deaths related to cervical cancer and a 9% reduction in all-cause mortality. I would challenge anybody to look at the results of any screening trial that has ever been published, randomized screening trial, that has ever shown a reduction in all-cause mortality as well as cause-specific mortality. This is the first and the only trial. This was presented as a plenary session talk at ASCO. My colleague, uh, Dr. Shastri, made that presentation. ASCO, for your uh, information, receives about 30,000 abstracts for their, for their meeting. About three or four are selected for plenary. This was one of those three or four out of 30,000. We received a standing ovation from more than 35,000 oncologists across the globe for a fantastically run trial saving lives. <laughs> when implemented in India itself, would save 22,000 lives annually for women of India. If implemented anywhere else globally, 
for developing world would save 78,000 lives annually. And this was implementable by healthcare workers who were 10th pass. 10th pass workers trained for two months. Solid results, the only robust evidence for saving of lives was screening of cervical cancer. Both those done, what was remarkable is that post, after the uh, presentation, in the press interaction, the scribes from US had this very remarkable suggestion that there are parts of US where PAP is not implementable. This is an excellent alternative for the United States. <laughs> Having said all that, when it comes to the, the trial results, the day we had the difference emerging, reaching statistical significance, this data was shared with Department of Health, Union Government of India, Department of Health, Maharashtra State, and as we talk, 15 states have adopted VIA, all the ASHA workers and health workers have been trained, and we already have 15 states in India implementing VIA for cervical cancer. Treatment. The ground level practices for cervical cancer screening did not exist. There is no cervical cancer, there was no cervical cancer screening prior to 1997-1999. And you might say that the end point of a study is to, that uh, we did see a slide showing that from 24-25 the incidence of cervical cancer has reduced to 6 per 100,000 in United States <clears throat> and in Vietnam it has reduced from 25-26 to 11. Both have been credited to cervical cancer screening by pap smear. I'm not saying that pap smear will not do it, but I want you to look at data from Bombay Cancer Registry. We have no pap smear, we have no VIA, when this data came in, we have no screening, we have no prevention. The data for cervical cancer incidence in Mumbai in year 1972 stands at 27 per 100,000 per year. The data for cervical cancer, as I got it day before yesterday from the Bombay Cancer Registry, stands at 8 per 100,000. My suggestion that reduction from 27 or 26 to 8 without doing anything. There is a reduction naturally happening with improved personal hygiene. Our Muslim brethren, whether in Mumbai or in Barshi, in Barshi the incidence still stands at 28 per 100,000. But the Muslims in Mumbai have an incidence which is Four per hundred thousand. Muslims in Barshi have an incidence which is four per hundred thousand. We are looking at personal hygiene. My interaction and suggestion to the Union Health Minister is provide running water, good sanitation and personal hygiene to every individual in rural India where it is needed. Half the diseases will be gone. <laughs> Had HPV vaccination being introduced 20 years ago, we would have credited HPV vaccine. Why are we spending money? Till the time prevention happens, we may have to do something. Let's do it low cost. This is doable, shown to be implementable, implemented, we'll have results. We already have results of reduction from 26 to 8. At 8 per 100,000, disease does not require preventive and screening strategy. Screening is required for common diseases. If I were to ask in Bhuleshwar, should I be looking for tiger? 
it is a foolish exercise. There are many other common diseases for which we need to look at for screening purposes. But the trial was performed essentially to see the efficacy and its implementability in rural India, where the routine thing like VIA would be taken care of without any problem. Problem created that we may go to population, create that there is something not right, detected. Presently, every state government is sold a hub and spoke model for primary care, for the tertiary care, sorry, for tertiary care, and every spoke in every district hospital will be able to take care of all the patients who are detected like this. I don't see any reason why efficacy of one procedure needs to be coupled with deprecating some other procedure. We don't need to. Let there be a cafeteria choice. And people can take. Somebody wants to have absolutely I have no problem at all about it. Somebody wants to have VIA, that's absolutely fine. You want to have HPV vaccine, but let there be knowledge that what each of them mean, what they cost, and what is the present perception of risk. It can't be that one of the greatest uh, film actresses says that I need to have bilateral mastectomy, that every woman should have bilateral mastectomy. That's not right. Perception of risk is required. Reality of risk perception. And reality of risk perception is that the incidence of cervical cancer in city of Mumbai, the same is true for city of Delhi, Bangalore, Chennai, and Kolkata. It's under 10. Incidence of cervical cancer less than 10 per 100,000. How different is it compared to six in the United States without doing anything? You have not spent any money, just plain, simple, personal hygiene. My advice would be that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Padre. I would request you to wait here because I suspect there will be responses in the question and answer session. But before we do that, I would now like to uh, invite our second discussant, uh, Dr. Amar Jasani. Uh, Amar is, uh, I don't know how to describe him, he's a doctor, but he gave up medicine some time back and I think he did a good job at that. It is a good step. Um, Amar is now uh, into uh, ethics. He is now the editor of the Indian General Medical Ethics. Uh, he teaches ethics in many institutions in India abroad and abroad. And uh, I would now like to request Amar to respond, and following which we'll open it for discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I am here as, a, as an editor of the journal where uh, uh, Dr. Eric Subha's paper was published in 2014. And uh, I would like to discuss uh, more in detail about what were the considerations that uh, led to uh, the publication and uh, many other issues related uh, uh, to the issue, to the to the you know points that he has raised here. But before I go on to that, I must uh, uh, declare that I once upon a time, for one and a half years, that is between 2006 and 2007, I sat on the ethics committee of the Tata Memorial Centre, and it was a, a a really great experience for me. This is, the, this is the institution which has been doing a, a massive amount of uh, pioneering uh, cancer research in India. And as a, as a member of the ethics committee, we had to work really hard. I, I haven't seen the ethics committee so far. And I have been uh, with Sri Chitra, I have been with the Nizam institution, you know, ethics committees and all the, all the other uh, big uh, biomedical institutions. But here was the institutions where uh, sometimes we had to sit every 15 days. And uh, in one sitting we had to tackle more than 20 you know, agenda items and uh, large number of clinical trials and, uh, and, and the amendments in clinical trials and also I learned quite a lot. Uh, this was also the period when uh, uh, the Bombay trial was on. Uh, the only thing that I can say that uh, although I knew the trial was on because uh, in Indian Journal of Medical Ethics, I think the first time uh, a comment on this was published by uh, Sandhya Srinivasan in 2003 or 4, and there was some discussion on that. However, uh, uh, I never had uh, an opportunity to get the protocol to review and understand, uh, you know, what were the exit issues. 
I came to know more about it uh, after the Dr. Subha's article was published in Indian Journal of Medical Ethics. So that is, I think, a background in my declaration. The uh, one important uh, part of uh, today's meeting, which I feel uh, uh, really very proud of as a person who is in the field of bioethics, is that uh, I think for us in India we are now setting a new tradition where we can uh, sit together and discuss our own research and uh, debate and deliberate. I think debating and deliberating is uh, fundamental to the development of ethics. If you see the way the bioethics has developed in USA uh, and you read uh, you know, American medical journals, you'll find that uh, the doctors and scientists come forward reviewing and uh, critiquing each other's paper. A number of uh, 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 large clinical trials which have been debated, sometimes very sharply, more sharply than what we have been doing on the subject. And yet, uh, 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 you know, nobody uh, getting uh, 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 any, you know, any kind of wish hunting on anybody or, uh, you know, hanging anybody and saying that, well, you, are, you, you get out of this. There is a lot of respect for good work people are doing. And yet, uh, when we are doing research, we do uh, follow certain paths uh, which may run into controversy. So I don't think we are belittling any scientist or science here, but we are trying to learn from what we are doing. And I think that is a good interactive uh, method, or what they call Socratic method of, uh, of learning ethics. And if this tradition uh, strengthens in coming time in India, I am sure uh, uh, we will be doing more introspection and uh, you know, interacting with each other in a very good, critical manner. That is the role of the journal too. And the medical journals in India, unlike say, when you read the Lancet, where Lancet editor can make a comment about uh, India, you know, slashing health budget and then coming out with his own, 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 own comment, or India's, uh, you know, the way India looks at the sexual assault and, and rape and other things. Well, why Indian medical journals are not able to reflect on these issues and say that what is the role of medicine and health system in, 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 in this kind of thing. So that way I feel uh, uh, as an Indian Journal of Medical Ethics, we were uh, quite uh, uh, you know, keen on, uh, on, on getting into the issues where uh, some critical questions are asked. Dr. Subha's paper uh, required, I think uh, it went on for uh, peer review for almost nine months. He was very, very patient with that. And uh, there were several people who did the peer review of the journal, including one person who said that it should be rejected. And I remember meeting that person in Geneva in a World Health Organization meeting, and I asked that, uh, why do you think that uh, he should be rejected? He said, no, issues are very correct, what is raised there. But the major problem was that this was the research which may perhaps uh, help uh, large number of women, VIA, the visual inspection with acetic acid, if that, is, that can be universalized, used as a, as, a, as a very cheap tool for uh, detecting precancerous lesions, then it will have a very tremendous impact. And I, I agreed. I said, yes, there is nobody is saying that uh, the intentions were bad. The intentions were excellent. If you look at Tuskegee trial, when it was started, those, who, those of you who have come to say some of my uh, ethics training uh, uh, sessions, we show a film called, you know, Miss Evers Boys, where uh, the whole thing starts with an excellent, under, you know, uh, commitment, saying that we want to prove that the black people suffer from the syphilis in the same way as the white people. And they were fighting ideologically and in ideally against, uh, uh, against, uh, 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 against racism. Like, doctors were highly committed and they were very sensitive to the black people and yet, at the end of 40 years, the world was shocked that these are the same good doctors with so much of sensitivity for, uh, for, for black people had done a study which allowed the black people to develop syphilis and die. I think this is a, a, a crux, crux of the issue for me as far as the bioethics is concerned, that uh, this could happen to anybody, any scientist. So here uh, is also that, uh, you know, the, the, the reviewer who said that, yes, they've had a very good intention, so I do agree. I also recollected at that time, and I used that case study quite a lot in my teaching, uh, again, 
concerning cell carcinoma cervix done in India with Indian government funding. This was a study done in, uh, from 1990, 1975 to 1990, uh, where uh, they wanted to understand uh, the natural history of the cervical cancer, to understand that which are the precancerous lesions convert into the carcinoma in situ. And they recruited more than 1,000 women and they observed them without giving any intervention for six years to understand how many of them who are having a, you know, precancerous lesions to convert into the carcinoma in situ. That also had uh, some amount of discussion. Unfortunately, it did not raise as much uh, as uh, it has done here. I pressed Dr. Subha's persistence and uh, he came to the National Biotics Conference and, uh, and, and, and uh, in, in, in 2014 December has come again and delivered this lecture, so I think we are having uh, more discussion on the subject. But that research was also conducted with a huge devotion, saying that uh, if we find out which are the lesions which will con you know, convert into the carcinoma situ more, then we'll be able to conserve resources by intervening in those women where those lesions are going to convert into carcinoma early. You know, so this is how the uh, uh, entire thing was uh, conceptualized. So I would not... Uh, 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 go into the issue of, uh, of, of intent. Intent were excellent. Does, do this intent really translate into a good ethics or not? I think that is the, that is the debate as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I find that uh, there was a problem. You can't observe, you can't recruit women and observe them for six years to find out whether they convert into carcinoma or C2 or not. Just as the Tuskegee trial, you cannot recruit black people to find out, you know, how, you know, syphilis plays out for the coming time. And the end result is either death or, you know, something, that was what was in syphilis, and here the death end result was development of carcinoma, carcinoma in situ when, when they were intervened. Now this issue has certain connection with, uh, with this trial also, you know, where uh, uh, Dr. Suba kept saying that 150,000 women were provided no intervention. That means for 15 years, uh, for whatever the length of uh, trial, I mean, at the three different centers, the lengths were different, where the no intervention arm were not screened at all. When the screening has been definitely, you know, regarded in, 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 in the scientific world as the requirement. I think this is an area that uh, really moved me, and uh, that's how uh, we went ahead and uh, uh, published this uh, paper. And I'm very happy that. Uh, this kind of uh, debate has taken place. The last thing that I wanted to uh, put before uh, you can have a larger discussion is that uh, was this kind of study possible ever, say, in the United States? I would like to ask, uh, you know, because I'm not an oncologist. I, my, my own technical uh, understanding is very, very low. And, and, and Dr. Bert has said that uh, there are big black, black pockets uh, in USA where uh, even pap smear is not uh, available, you know, and it is not a standard. So, would they have done, I mean, with NIH funding, because money came, both NIH and, and, and Gates Foundation was from the U.S., would they have been permitted to conduct this study in the U.S.? Because there are some pockets uh, where uh, uh, the standard of care was not pap smear at all. I would say no. It wouldn't have happened there. They wouldn't have allowed. Because they know that, you cannot sacrifice some people with good intent now in order to do good for the millions of women later on. I mean, this is what happened in the 1975 to 1990 trial, where uh, women we are having, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the precancerous lesions, they converted into carcinoma in situ. This is not allowed because they are under your care. They are part of the, as a participants in the, in the research. And you have a higher uh, uh, ethical uh, obligations for them as compared to in the normal clinical uh, practice. So they would not have allowed that. They would not have allowed uh, uh, this pe uh, the black people, black women uh, who are not having pap smear to be observed for 15 years to find out, you know, what, what is the battle, you know, VIA or, 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 or... So this perhaps can also be looked at as a project where some kind of ethics dumping took place or double standard by the funders. I think that's how Dr. Subha's uh, focus. So these are U.S. funded trials and uh, he kept, he has been demanding in the U.S. 
that U.S. should acknowledge this, that they did something wrong by supporting it, and should uh, apologize in the same way, right, as they did to the Tuskegee participants, and should make uh, the funding to ensure that all these women who were not screened, you know, money is made available for screening and providing intervention so that, uh, you know, they, they, they really get what they, they, they should have got under the trial. I think this is the, these are the key issues uh, around which the most of the ethical debate on this subject is coming. There are a lot of other technical aspects and a lot of good achievements, as I said, uh, there, and they, they are not to be belittled. I think they will be used historically in coming time as a, you know, 1975-90 trial uh, uh, of uh, natural history of uh, carcinoma. Uh, cervix had uh, really helped in a big way in setting up, uh, you know, the whole program on the carcinoma cervix in India. Same way, I'm sure a lot of women will ultimately uh, benefit from it, but those who really participated and who were denied the care, I think we need to look at them and uh, also see that if there were uh, real uh, uh, you know, errors uh, in, in terms of ethics committed during the trial. Thank you. Thank you, Amar. Um, so uh, we uh, would like to now uh, open this out uh, for debate and discussion. But before I do do that, uh, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll come to you. Uh, uh, can I ask uh, the people on the dais, uh, would you like to briefly respond to the points made by the others? Is there, uh, would you like to do that? OK. Dr. Badway, thank you for coming today. And I've just got a couple of questions. Your study, was it a study of downstaging compared to no downstaging, or of screening compared to no screening? The study had the endpoint of mortality reduction. Downstaging was a surrogate marker to be proven that we may look for mortality. But the study was aimed at reducing mortality related to cervical cancer. That was the endpoint. So it was a downstaging study. It was not a downstaging study. Downstaging was a necessary surrogate marker to, to look for mortality. The end point of the study was a reduction in mortality. The aim of the study was reduction in mortality. Thank you. My next question is... Well, I have a request. Could you just introduce yourself for the audience and then, of, of course, yeah. Sure. There are two mice there. Okay, my name is Sudeep Gupta and I'm a medical oncologist at Tata. I just need to respond to you. You know, you repeatedly characterize the test as a downstaging test. There is nothing about any test that characterizes it as either downstaging or screening. Mammography can be in different contexts used either as downstaging or as screening. It is the endpoints of the study that you were alluding to, and as Dr. Budway rightly pointed out, the primary endpoint of the study was reduction in cervical cancer mortality. So you cannot characterize a test as a downstaging test. Well, then my follow up question is. How do you explain the extraordinarily low disease detection rates for your intervention? Because the, the precancerous detection was not the end point. 75% of CIN1 and CIN2 are reversible. They disappear over a period of time. The primary goal is to reduce mortality. That's it. That has been proven. Beyond doubt, statistical significance, reduction in cause-specific mortality, reduction in all-cause mortality. There is no such robust evidence for pap smear. Thank you very much for uh, coming all the way to tell us what we need. Do we have that slide which you kept on repeatedly putting up, I think 20 times in your presentation. Can I see it once again, please? which showed that uh, in one of my studies, the detection rate was higher as compared to the second study, right?
that's the one thank you thank you that's the one yes i think your representation of that particular slide is either ill informed or mischievously misrepresenting because it very clearly says in the methodology of both those studies yes the mic is on it very clearly says in the methodology of those two studies the first one is a hospital based study the hospital is the preventive oncology clinic where we get referrals the second one is a community based study for the audience i'll just explain if i were to take a team of people in a community to find out how many cases of tuberculosis we have in this community the answer would be 5 out of 1000 2 out of 1000 or something like that but if i were to do the same thing in the tb opd of this hospital how much would that be it would be much higher and that is explained in the methodology i think you are purposely mischievously been misrepresenting it all the time i am not finished i am not finished i would sir come to you and it's a journal of medical ethics and pardon my saying so any journal and all the more a journal of medical ethics should have looked into a contentious paper which you said was reviewed for 9 months and then decided to invite the authors of the publications where allegations are being made to respond side by side with those so that people get a correct view not just one point of view will you agree with that and you didn't do it thank you very much Dr. Shastri. It's on. Thank you for clarifying that. So you're saying that these numbers, 0.02%, those are the actual benchmarks for Mumbai. Thank you for clarifying that. Then my next question for Dr. Shastri and Dr. Bhagwat. In 2007, The Lancet published the results of the Tamil Nadu study. showing that one round of VIA apparently caused 25% reductions in mortality and incidence why didn't you stop your study at that point i think we need to reiterate what medical literature and how learning takes place you pick up any large intervention that has changed clinical practice any large intervention that has changed clinical practice it comes in one trial if it is robust enough then it is implemented but if not it needs to be reproduced at least in one more trial before it is implemented as a routine practice we had finished our intervention by then it was only a routine follow up that was happening and that's the reason why it was not done i repeat again the day the second trial showed a difference the union health ministry the state health ministry were informed and as we talk more than 15 states have implemented via and all of them are getting via as a routine screening in rural parts of india where it is required i again repeat cervical cancer screening in cities of india is redundant with an incidence of 8 per 100000 it is redundant okay so we are going to open this out like to the audience now amar uh, yeah okay. I, okay i would also like to okay answer. uh dr shastri one second let amar respond and dr badwe and me sorry the question was directed to both dr badwe okay. and me i think i have business to answer i would also like to tell the audience that the ohrp what uh, dr suba has been continuously talking about was an investigation instigated by dr suba they investigated us for almost 6 months and it's there on their website it's a us government transparent website that puts everything up on the website what are their determinations what actions have been taken what at the end of the investigation did they find dr suba never talks about that what they found at the end of the investigation he said that they never told him that they are there on the website you just go and you have search for ohrp and you will find what are the determinations on the website there the uh, the question of uh, research integrity which dr suba talked about and there was an investigation on research integrity also on this trial and i must tell you that they not only exonerated us but they invited one of us for a meeting of 
the uh, research integrity in the US to discuss these kind of cultural, multi-country cultural issues related to ethics and related to research integrity out there. So they value our contributions to science. Three, I would like to inform you, Dr. Super, and I'm sure you know it already. Despite your cytology program that you set up in Vietnam, the government of Vietnam today, and please search that on the web too, is taking up VIA screening for the population. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amar, you wanted to respond? Uh. Uh, just a very brief uh, uh, response to how uh, the debate on the subject in Indian Journal of Medical Ethics has taken place. I think uh, uh, all of you, you know, who are part of this study had uh, uh, quite a lot of opportunities to write in the journal. And uh, if you go on the pages of the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics, you'll find that uh, all the reputers that have come so far have been uh, very scrupulously published. In addition to that, I, we also made a lot of efforts to uh, encourage debate by inviting uh, both uh, national as well as international bioethics experts to write on the subject. I think you'll find their papers, including uh, Professor Ruth Macklin, who is one of the topmost top most bioethicists in the USA, her views on the, on, on the trial and, uh, and the debates on the subject. The only uh, uh, humble request that I would like to make, and uh, many of you who read uh, medical literature, particularly British Medical Journal, would be aware that uh, there have been a lot of debate about what is called data sharing. And uh, ensuring that when we do clinical trial, we make anonymized data available to the larger number of experts to reanalyze and uh, relook at it. There was a, a very good debate and discussion uh, that came in BMJ, where uh, they went back uh, to the study 3 to 9, where there was an anti-psychiatric drug, and they relooked at the data of the clinical trial, you know, and uh, they found that uh, the way data were analyzed and published, there were a lot of problems. So this is a live debate and live discussion in the bioethics as well as uh, medical uh, uh, you know, science, that uh, what we are doing as scientists, we may always not be completely unbiased. Uh, you can definitely say that as a bioethicist, we are not uh, unbiased people, you know. We, our job is to pass a judgment, to say what is right and wrong. And they may also recognize a lot of gray area between right and wrong. But uh, we do stick our neck out and uh, say that there is some problem here. And we may sometimes be wrong. We may be, you know, criticized, so there's no doubt. I mean, uh, in philosophy, and bioethics is a discipline of philosophy, where criticizing and criticizing in the sharpest term is, uh, is very much acceptable. I think in medicine, uh, uh, we are not so tolerant to criticism. If you read in Economic and Poetical Weekly, I remember Professor uh, Richard Cash, who took, uh, I think, a couple of... Uh, 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 ethics training sessions in Tata Memorial Hospital when I was a member of the Ethics Committee. When I gave him to read Economic and Political Weekly, he said, my God, I have never seen this kind of discussion where the attacks on each other, you know, were so sharp. Because the differences in the policies, economics and all, they are sharply debated. But medicine doesn't do it to that extent and we are very polite with each other. But in bioethics, we are quite used to. So my suggestion would be, that uh, if you would like to get out of the controversy, be more transparent. Make your data available to more experts who come with a good reanalysis plan and uh, let also have look at them. Because when we claim that we are the great and we are, our, our, our data are, are good, uh, we need to have uh, more confirmation being done. I think this is a trend that is emerging at international level and it is going to engulf us in coming time. It may take, uh, we can resist it for some time through our, whatever effort, but sooner or later, science will have to become more transparent and more engaging with the public than it has been in the past. Okay, so uh, we have uh, lots of hands. I have a request. So, firstly, identify yourself, be brief, do not try not to repeat what has already been said, and um, we'll try and make it as representative as possible. Uh, Dr. Mitra, just before you, I think he's been raising a hand, so just give him an opportunity. So, Dr. Dr. Subha, in India we have a culture that guest is the god. So, Atiti Devo Bhav, so you are the god for us as a guest. 
But let me tell you, when you were making your presentation, I had a comment that you sounded more like a lawyer who is vociferously trying to save a client rather than presenting the science. Because see what happens, when you say that the plot is thickening, it is sounding like a Hollywood blockbuster rather than science. So that is one, because what happens when scientists wear the cap of activists, then you know their uh, credibility goes down. And therefore we have to be very careful in our public appearance, that is one. And second thing, I have a serious objection. When you compare... Okay, so uh, let's, let's, let's let me, please hear let him me, out. Let me, uh, let's let me please hear present him out. the question to you. The question is that you have repeatedly said that the controlled arm women were allowed to die. I have a serious objection to that. The reason is that in a population where this, arm, this study was going on, where one arm was receiving intervention, the other arm was a control arm, the third group was who were not part of the study. And let me tell you, the control arm is an active surveillance arm. It is not an arm where women are allowed to die like the real world who are outside the study. That is number one. Number two, you have been always comparing the non-screen group with the smoking that it is as unethical as running a smoking versus no smoking. That means you are saying that non-screened non women were akin to the smoking which is incorrect because fatality rate of smoking is one in three. Can you just try and be a little, there are yes. lots of hands, lots of people, right. so, uh, so your please try and uh, control. Your comparison is fallacious, malicious. The reason is that only in the non-screen group, eight out of 100,000 would have got cancer. But in smoking, one in three would die because of smoking. Even Tuskegee was an arm where the patients were being accrued and this arm, they are healthy women. And what I will end by Mahatma, Mahatma Gandhi said, if you want to find a solution, go and live the, where the problem is. We know the problem better and we know how to solve it. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Dr. Mitra. Yeah. Dr. <clears throat> Dr. Jasani said that watching women getting cervical cancer in black women was unethical. This is exactly what is happening today with TCIs in breast cancer. Because we don't know which breast cancer will become a real cancer. Breast TCIs is in situ cancer. We don't know which in situ will actually become a real cancer. So what Dr. Sunny said was unethical between 1965 and 90 whatever is happening in breast cancer today, in the enlightened day of today, because there is a serious problem. Because if you treat every TCIS, you are unnecessarily causing a mastectomy, unnecessarily giving radiotherapy, unnecessarily making the patient a cancer patient. So what Dr. Dasani said is unethical happening today in light and transparent society in breast cancer. Okay, uh, let's have, uh, yeah, Tina. Well, um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate GSMC for this wonderful interaction. I'm Dr. Reena Vani. I'm a professor of obstetrics and gynecology, a woman dealing with women, and I'm also a founder member of the Cooper Hospital Bioethics Unit and a sister concern of the same thing. So I'm representing both sides. There are no sides here. What I'd like to say, first of all, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Budwe on putting it in a nutshell. He has pointed out the conflict of interest over here. It is a question of perspective. A pathologist will always want to place the pap smear because he thinks that's his baby. Dr. Shastri has pioneered VIA. He thinks it's very good. That's something he has pioneered and he was praised in Mumbai Mirror for making vinegar save women. As a gynecologist, I would like to also say that Dr. Budwe said we need not screen in uh, Mumbai. I would not agree with him on that. I feel that this reduction to eight is not only because of personal hygiene, it is because of increased awareness, opportunistic screening. I'm in the public healthcare system, and I feel what you said, sir, about cafeteria approach is absolutely right. We have to make awareness, and we have to make the method available to women. So I think today there is no winner or loser in today's debate. I think I'm very happy we have focused on this issue and we have to make screening available to women. And uh, the very fact that Dr. Shastri's trial was ratified 
rigorously grilled and gone across by many, many international uh, organizations. I would say we have to give him credit for that. And we do have to see that the perspective of how the data is presented makes a huge difference. So I think all of us should keep our minds open and take things with a pinch of salt and do not get carried away when people say zombie arguments. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Jayashree Zoshi, and I'm very much interested in preventing cervical cancer. Uh, one technical point I just wanted to bring to the notice of uh, Dr. Subha, that uh, if we wanted to show any effect at all of VIA, and uh, had carried out the study in rural India, where past years are not available, it would not have been possible. I think only because it was conducted in Mumbai and with such rigorousness, they were able to follow up. Otherwise, when you don't have a follow up, you can't come to conclusions. And that is the reason why VIA has become available to women who have no screening method at all. Uh, two or three questions. Uh, we need to wind up in about uh, five to ten minutes uh, at the max. We are already beyond time. So uh, let's, yeah. Okay. Please. Dr. Subha, this is Priyanka from Hindustan Times. Uh, so we wanted to understand, uh, do you think implementing of the VIA testing that India is doing now will be incorrect according to uh, the, the assumptions that you have about the study? Could you repeat that? Uh, I'm asking that the implementation, India is implementing the VIA program now in 15 states as Dr. Badwe has already said. Is, is that incorrect or do you think that is wrong depending on the results of the study? Okay, uh, uh, suggestion that we take all some of the questions and then we give you a few minutes at the end to respond because we need to try and wind this up in the next 10 minutes. Uh, anybody from uh, Prabhu? Yeah, okay. My name is Pramesh. I'm a thoracic surgeon, far removed from cervical cancer. But again, declaring my conflict of interest, I work at the Tata Memorial Hospital, which uh, actually conducted the study. Uh, Good presentation. Unfortunately, sounded more like a uh, Michael Moore movie. If you've seen Fahrenheit 9/11, very biased in its uh, uh, interpretation. Three uh, main reasons why I feel so. I think your insistence on having detection of precancerous lesions as an endpoint by itself is fundamentally flawed. If you understand the research methodology that goes into screening trials. The only valid endpoint that you can look at in a screening trial, it's not survival, it's not progression-free survival, is mortality. It's a fundamental basis of any screening trial, and I'm disappointed that somebody who's so actively interested in cervical screening has been unable to understand that. Second, if you look at the uh, ICMR report of, uh, in the 80s, which looked at the feasibility of doing pap smear in India, the conclusions by an unbiased Indian Council of Medical Research, Government of India collaboration was that if you were to multiply the number of existing cytologists in India by 25 fold, you would still be able to screen only one fourth of India's women and that too once in a lifetime. Clearly saying that it's practically impossible to implement in a country like India. And Proof of principle by doing it in a small city in Vietnam doesn't really translate. I think India is slightly bigger than Vietnam by population. Finally, <laughs> finally, my point about cost effectiveness. If you had read through our editorial or our response in the IJME, the uh, uh, Harvard School of Public Health conducted a cost effective analysis comparing pap smear, VIA, and HPV DNA testing. The cost per life saved of VIA was 460 US dollars. The cost per life of HPV DNA was 25 times more at 11,500 US dollars. And the cost per life saved of pap smear was actually more than what HPV DNA testing would have actually cost. And in a very cost sensitive healthcare situation like India has, to suggest that either HPV DNA or pap smear could be universally implemented is being extremely naive. Thank you. Okay, Pramesh. Uh, um, I, you, you lost my support. How can you not like Michael Moore movies? But anyway, uh, Ravi. <laughs> um, I'm Ravi Dugal. Uh, 
from the Anusandhan Trust. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm a mere sociologist. My question is that, I mean, why are we not also talking, while we do these clinical trials, why aren't we talking about greater transparency and social justice for the people who are part of the trials and so on? I think that's a very critical question that we need to uh, also address in, uh, when, when, we, when we do clinical trials and so on. Okay. Any other questions, comments? Uh, before you, I, uh, because you've already had your flow. Uh, okay, Meena? Yeah, yeah. Uh, hi, I, I have a question for Dr. Badwe. Uh, if VIA and pap smear are known in their efficacy, in their specificity or whatever, and all that you were doing is to check whether VIA can be conducted in rural India, what is the need to have a control arm of no screening? You test all women and you see whether it is viable or not. You can test it with a standard pap smear if you have to. But what was the need to have a no screening arm? I think that was highly unethical in your trial. And I don't think any of you all have addressed that. Well, I've just given that, oh, government of India is so great, and international bodies have done this great thing. But well, you have to answer this very basic question. What is the need of just observing these women like that? You're your first statement, your first statement that efficacy of VIA and pap smear is proven is wrong. It's false. The evidence that is required in medical practice to show that this is effective is a good, robust, randomized trial. Lest we will be doing 20 procedures which are done in the United States and withdrawn mammography in today's paper withdrawn. Why is it withdrawn after 20 years of practice? The evidence came up that it is useless. It is harmful. It is exactly what I'm trying to tell you. That surrogate marker that something is detected does not necessarily mean the lives will be saved. I'll give you an example. I do a physical examination on 100 or 1,000 women walking on streets of, say, United States for breast examination, I'll pick up two cancers. Women are ostensibly normal. I increase the sensitivity by doing mammography, that number two will become four. I do the sensitivity greater by doing MRI, that four will become eight. God forbid nothing should happen to these women if they were to die of vehicular accident not diagnosed with cancer, and if I were to increase the sensitivity of detection by looking at, please, don't misunderstand, from one end to the other, the number of, this, such experiments have, been, have happened. The number of cancers are approximately 240 in 1,000 women. Increasing sensitivity does not mean we now know that change from physical versus physical plus mammography, a trial comparing increased sensitivity, does it save lives? 20 years follow-up, no saving of lives. But 30% excess detection done. Excess detection does not necessarily mean efficacy. If I were to walk through that little metal detector in airport, if it were to detect past or present corrupt thought in human mind, I wonder who will be able to walk through it. I will not be able to walk through it. But we are not looking for a single corrupt thought. We are looking for somebody who can pick up AK-47 and kill. We are looking for a terrorist, we are looking for a cancer that will kill, not a non-cancer. Look at it some other, I will give you the ethics point of view. If increasing sensitivity does not save lives, but picks up more cancer, what does it mean? That increased sensitive cancers, sensitivity cancers are non-killer cancers. If I am a market force person, what am I selling as a doctor? I'm selling immortality, isn't it? I, patient, I don't want my patients to die. Here is a set of individuals who will never die but have cancer under microscope. I want to treat only those. Ten years down the line, I will be looked upon as the most successful doctor. Anything that he treats never dies, but in the first place they were not supposed to die. Market forces completely exploited. Thank you very much.
Okay, I think uh, we we have to uh, conclude. We are well beyond time, and uh, before uh, we wind up, and uh, Dr. Badwe has to leave, everyone has to leave. I just want to uh, once more say that uh, the talk, as I said, was provocative, and you succeeded in pr provocating. Um, but I think, as Amar said, uh, this is perhaps rare and historical that uh, we have sat together for two hours, debated, discussed, deferred, and. Uh, Perhaps this is a good beginning. I now would like to uh, call upon the organizers to uh, would like to propose a vote of thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would like to appreciate all the speakers, the discussants, and the chairperson for the since handling of the issue so sensitively, so graciously, and so scientifically, and all the audience also. And for the points, especially the cultural and social diversities which have come up and the way they have been dealt with. On behalf of the GSMC MUHS UNESCO Bioethics Unit, it is my privilege to acknowledge and appreciate all the people who have contributed towards the organization of this program. We have an overwhelming response to this lecture, and at the outset, I would like to thank, sorry, I would like to apologize to all the audiences or some delegates who were inconvenienced due to the insufficient number of seats. I would like to thank Dr. Eric Subha for delivering the 8th Krishna Raj Memorial Lecture. May I invite Dr. Dhruv Mankad Managing Trustee Anusandan Trust to please come on the dais and felicitate Dr. Subha. Thank you, sir. Our Dean, Dr. Avinash Supesar, who is also the chairperson of our bioethics unit, has been a source of constant support and encouragement for all of our activities. Thank you, sir. We would like to thank Dr. Sanjay Nagral, sir, for taking time out of his busy schedule in chairing the session and doing it so wonderfully. May I invite Dr. Manisha Gupta, founding trustee of Masum and health rights advocate for more than 25 years, to please come on the dais and felicitate Dr. Nagral. Thank you, ma'am. We had a lively and thoughtful, thought-provoking discussion after the lecture. And, and thank both our discussants, Dr. Rajendra Badwe and Dr. Amar Jasani, sir, for the same. May I invite Padma Prakash, Executive Director of E-Social Sciences, to please come on the dais and felicitate the discussants. Dr. Rajendra Badwe. Dr. Amar Jesani. Dr. Amar Jesani. We are grateful to Dr. Vibhuti Patel for giving us a brief introduction about the Krishna Raj Memorial Lecture and Anusandhan Trust. Madam, will you please come on the dais? May I request Dr. Santosh Salagare, head of our bioethics unit, to give a token of appreciation to Madam. Thank you, Madam and Sir. This, le this lecture was a combined effort of various partners, and we thank all of them. Sehat, Masum, E-Social Sciences, University of Mumbai, SNDT University, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, and Forum for Medical Ethics Society. Then Kinare Hall staff has been very helpful in arranging the logistics. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all the audience here today, without whom the program would not have been successful, especially the various heads of department, faculty members, members of the ethics committee and heads of bio unit, units of MCGM hospitals and representatives of our various partners. Please do take a look at the publication counter outside the hall and join us for some snacks. Thank you once again for joining us. Thank you all. <laughs>